Okay, good. Um, now, Pompeii was only one of several towns on the Bay of um, Naples um, under the um, shadow of um, Vesuvius. I couldn't resist this image um, to show you. And um, like any other town, ancient and modern, it was a town on the move. In fact, it was moving forward, <laughs> moving backwards, moving from side to side, moving up, moving down, thanks to what you're looking at at the moment. Now, as with any other um, urban community, if you like, um, if there was a downturn in real estate and, you know, you perhaps wasn't a good time to um, think about moving, there was a slump in the market, well, it might be a good idea to sort of maybe put in that extra bedroom that we've been thinking about or maybe a lick of paint here and there. And what about the dreary lounge room? Surely that could do with brightening up. So why not get the painters in, smarten things up a bit? So not all the damage from the um, destruction that we see was actually um, caused um, by earthquake or um, the massive earthquake in AD 62, but also the um, eruption in 79. Houses were being brought up, they were being joined up, they were being expanded, contracted, walls knocked through, walls bricked up on a monumental um, scale. Now, although there's no doubt that the unusually large amount of um, damage and destruction was caused um, by um, the major earthquake and then the eruption, it can't all be put down to these two um, disasters. So we have to consider that some of the work in progress that we see at the time of the eruption was due to either um, the earthquake that was caused 17 years earlier, which seems to indicate that they took an awful long time in um, uh, carrying out repairs, or the town was undergoing a series of minor tremors, if you like, throughout this period and especially building up to the Big Bang. Now, it's just possible that it was even harder to get a decent tradie to come out in ancient Pompeii <laughs> as it seems to be in modern day Perth, like, you know, having the gaping hole fixed in the atrium and... What about the unsightly cracks in the bedroom ceiling? But I doubt that it would take 17 years to get a tradesman, even so. So it's more likely, I think, that these annoying cracks and such like were appearing in the plaster every other um, couple of weeks, if you like. Now, you can imagine um, perhaps the lady of the household, and we'll call her Mrs. Domina, lying in bed, gives the old man an elbow in the ribs, says something like, Hey you, videsne in hot kylo, fissuras. Or in other words, have you seen the cracks in this ceiling? Now, to the houses themselves. Well, in this region, houses... <coughs> excuse me, took three forms. We have um, the large <coughs> country villa that we can actually reconstruct from the actual wall paintings that we'll be looking at. Then we have um, apartment blocks, insula, that take their, um, they have the same name as the actual block of um, buildings that you find in a Roman town. So these were called in the plural insulae. And then we have uh, what we were looking at today, which is the um, domus, the townhouse, more or less. And this was overseen by either a dominus or a domina, the head of this um, household. And we're going to look at this process and the result of the painted decoration of these houses. Now, the Via della Bondanza was what we call the main drag 
through Pompeii. And down here we had all the homes of the wealthy, we had businesses, public areas, a temple or two, but this was the main um, strait. Now on the via, we had Pompeii's um, main shopping street, like I said. But here, for example, stands the large house of Julius Polybius, and this is the ground plan. This is reconstructed from what the excavator had found. And here is a street facade of the house of Julius Polybius. Now, it takes its name, actually, from a piece of electioneering graffito that was found on the outside of the house. So, obviously, it was very upward mobile, um, upwardly mobile, or he'd already arrived. And this is a little bit of vault um, for Julius um, Polybius. Now, a little bit further on, a couple of doors down, um, is what has become known... Uh, for reasons that will become obvious, the house of the painters at work. Now, this house was situated to the rear of what is called the bakery of the chaste lovers. Um, now, um, we'll have a look at the paintings from the bakery of the chaste lovers, and you'll um, realise then why it's um, called the bakery of the chaste lovers. In fact... My house down in Dawesville is actually called the House of the Chase Lovers. Now, <laughs> between um, these two um, complexes, the House of Julius Polybius ran an alleyway. Um, this hasn't really got much to do with what I'm talking about, but it's interesting nonetheless because there were, um, the cesspits um, that collected the latrine waste um, between these two houses in this alleyway had been dug up and cleaned out just before the eruption. And the piles of refuse were still waiting to be found by the excavators almost 2,000 years later. Like I said, I won't go into that because that's for David to get his hands into later, so to speak. Now, Julius Polybius, as you can see, this um, house is quite imposing, um, quite something to look at. And the white room of this house, um, it's one of the iconic um, decorated rooms in Pompeii and so famous that the University of Tokyo has actually reconstructed this for a visual uh, tour virtual reality tour of this room. So if you go on the um, web, you can actually have a tour of this famous white room. Now, Vitruvius, who wrote on such things, says, but these imitations, which were based on reality, are now scorned by the improper taste of the present time. On the plaster, there are now monstrosities rather than definite images taken from real life. Now, what he's referring to are these kinds of paintings on these walls, what we could call architectural whimsies. They're the fourth style, so-called, of Pompeian wall painting, and they're full of um, strange little um, animal figures, um, impossibly um, slender columns supporting an architrave. So they're nothing like the um, deceit of the eye, for example, that we had in earlier decorated Pompeian houses. For example, um, in the centre of one of these um, walls was the punishment of Dirke. Now, the um, story of Dirke, this was in the largest room of the house which um, led on to a garden. And this was a favourite theme of um, painters and decorators, if you like, in Pompeii. Now, it's a gory myth in which the sons of a victim of a Theban queen, who was a follower of Dionysus, take their revenge by tying their victim to the horns of a bull, a bull that she might suffer a long, lingering and painful death. Now, this is a strange subject, you might think, for the decoration of a house, but it was really popular. And why I think this is particularly interesting is that a visitor to the, to the house 
actually left a critique of the painting as a piece of graffito on a um, wall in the service area of the property. So he'd come in as a visitor and thought, well, that's all right, I like that, I'll give a little um, critique of it as I leave. Now, the house of the painters at work, this is across the alleyway, as I said, from the house of Julius Polybius and to the rear of the bakery that I said. And it's the appropriately named House of the Painters at Work. Now, what I'm suggesting is, and always remember that these are real people, they're just like uh, we are now, right? They had the same um, aspirations, they had the same envies, they had the same uh, pretty much taste, whether it was good taste, poor taste, indifferent, but they were just like we were. And they perhaps looked on in envy at things. So, what I'm suggesting is that the lady of this house was quite chummy with Mrs. Polybius across the alleyway. It's not unlikely. But not so chummy that she couldn't see that her neighbour's house was looking a bit more um, modern in its decor than her own. So naturally, having spent the afternoon having a couple of glasses of the best Pompeian red, you might say, and some nibbly things. The disgruntled Mrs. Domina goes back home to her husband and to, you've guessed it, nag him. <laughs> he must be doing well for himself next door. You should see their place. <laughs> and you went to school with him. <laughs> And so it was that on the morning of, and for the sake of argument, because that's for a later date, the 24th of August, AD 79, just as they seem to have been doing for quite a few weeks, a gang of painters, probably about three or four of them, and perhaps a few more, were fulfilling Mrs. Domina's lifestyle ambitions and her hopes of scoring one up on her next door. Now, room 14... It seems that the boss had quite a clear picture of what she wanted. None of this stick-to-neutral shades rubbish for her. Be bold. That was her motto, and that was their brief. And I want lots of stuff. I want snakes, and I want squiggly things and I want monsters and I want floaty things whatever you've got I'm having and stay alert because it might change again tomorrow <laughs> well that's as maybe but it's clear that this was a work in progress because piles of lime were found in the colonnades of this peristyle um, garden as well as sand, and as well as the tesserae, the small stones that make up mosaics, as well as um, other materials in a dump, if you like, that was close to the kitchen. So they'd been told, leave all the stuff out here because you're not bringing that inside the house. Leave it out here, and you can cart it backwards and forwards. Now, in this room, as, uh, known as room 16, this is the largest room of the house and it's about 50 square metres. And the painters were at work, um, it would seem, when the eruption started. So it was probably about midday. And they left in such a hurry that they left their equipment. They left scaffolding. And by the way, this isn't the original <laughs> scaffolding. Although it, you know, it looks in quite good, uh, Nick, so you wouldn't be deceived. So they left scaffolding, jars of plaster, compasses, as many as 50 jars of paint, some that had been thrown into a basket um, in one of the rooms of the peristyle again, so obviously an area where they could leave all their equipment. Now the centre panel is interesting because... The painters, who were quite naturally starting at the top and working their way down, as you should, they'd um, 
we're working, it appears, on a large middle zone. And two of the main panels, one black and one red, had already um, been completed. But the um, dado or dado, that frees around the bottom, and, and that wasn't ready for painting because it hadn't, it hadn't had its final fine coat of plaster. So they still had to get round to that, but that's all right because we're working our way down from the top. We can tell this. Now separating all these uh, painted panels, the black and the red panels, were these um, decorations of I, um, what I said were architectural uh, whimsies. They were narrow columns. Um, they were intertwined with um, foliage, with um, impossibly plumed birds that bore uh, no resemblance to reality. So probably these were the in thing because she's got them next door, so we have to have these. Now, on the left, um, a whole panel, as you see, uh, was waiting to be painted. How do we know this? Because it's had a coat of fine plaster put on it. And anybody who knows about fresco painting knows that you have to put this fine coat of wet plaster on the wall and paint it while it's still wet. Otherwise, um, the paint won't set into the wall. So that was the fresco technique. So we can see the work in progress here, exactly what's happening. Okay, but why does it look as rough as it does? Now, at the bottom of the center panel, <coughs> Um, like here, an artist of some considerable talent has already painted this beautiful, detailed little um, frieze and it's cupids having a chariot race. And I've darkened it here so that you can make out exactly what's happening because the lead chariot has had a nasty spill. Now this is an exquisite piece of very fine, detailed workmanship at the bottom of this panel. So these um, painters, they would in this team be um, somebody who would rough plaster the wall, somebody who would fine plaster it, somebody who would uh, apply the um, vast coats of red or black paint, so probably an apprentice, and then um, a master of the art of wall painting who puts in these beautiful um, details. And it's possible that the master painter's job was to create these kinds of groups and scenes, um, the little groups that we call floating figures that we find in the center of these panels. Now, to come back to this central panel, this is the focal point of anybody who looks at this um, room. But it for what, who looks at this room now because of this extraordinary um, damage that seems to have been done. But it was also going to be the focal point of the room in AD um, 79 because, as you can see in the center, if I can do this, here you can just make out that that's um, yellow ochre and it's where the main um, images would have been painted. And it seems that it was going to be another story from mythology, and it was going to have quite a few figures in it. And there are traces of blue above where um, there was obviously going to be a sky, so it was going to be an outdoor scene, and this was going to be the focus of the room. So it was going to be um, a scene from mythology. Now, we can't tell any more about the picture because it's obscured by what I think is one of the most interesting things in the whole of the ruins of Pompeii. And that's this single element in the middle of this wall in this room. The image has been covered by a rough layer of what still looks like dripping plaster. Now, it can only have been caused 
by a bucket full of plaster being tipped over this work in progress. In other words, it can only have come about when somebody who was on a scaffold got into a panic and started to run for it and kicked his bucket of plaster over and it splashed all over what was going to be this masterpiece in the middle of the room. And it was probably when the floor started to move that they sort of got the hint that it might actually be time to run. Now, next door on the uh, Via del Abundanza itself and fronting this house um, in the strange Pompeian way that you'd have houses, magnificently decorated houses, with a shop at the front, I suppose acting as security um, to some extent. But here was a bakery at the front of this house, the bakery of the Chase Lovers. Now, we'll only be concerned with what is an unusual feature, um, one might think, for a regular bakery. And that's a very large, uh, richly decorated dining room, um, this one. Now, it was probably the equivalent of a tapas bar or something, because it's not a tavern that we're looking at. It's a kind of an eating, drinking place at the back of the um, bakery. So it seemed to have served as a uh, commercial establishment if the size and the decoration is anything to go by. And there are a series of paintings um, in here, and this is where it takes its name from, because this is a fresco of lovers um, kissing. Now, those of you who came to the uh, lecture that I gave on women in Roman art will remember that this is nothing like the paintings that, say, we um, get in some houses and even uh, brothels, how to improve your um, sex life, manuals of the ancient world that were painted all over the um, bedrooms or brothels. So this is then um, quite a chaste scene, really. It's quite romantic. We're sitting, um, having a feast, and there are lovers, and they're being affectionate. But another of the paintings shows actually a quite drunken um, scene. This figure here, you can just see, is lying there with his arm up. It's not too clear, but he's obviously already collapsed and nursing his sore head. This woman here is obviously being propped up by a household slave. Do you know who I, I think that is? That's Mrs. Domina. <laughs> and she's so stressed out with this painting gang she has in the house that she's gone through into the bakery and she's thought, I don't know, bugger this. Give me a glass of your finest Pompeian red. I've had it with these guys. Right? Perfect, isn't it? Doesn't it fit in just so well? <laughs> I'm awful. Now, we'll leave these people in this nice little um, duplex area, if you like, because no lecture on the um, wall paintings of Pompeii would be complete without a look at the Villa of the Mysteries. Now, the Villa of the Mysteries, and I'll show you in a minute where it gets its name from, but um, it was built around this central um, here, central peristyle um, area and it was surrounded by terraces and it was a lot like other large villas in Pompeii. It wasn't a country villa that I mentioned at the beginning but it was a very large house and it contains a very unusual feature um, here which is known as the Hall of the Mysteries. It's an, in, um, or the whole of the initiation, if you like. And it measures um, 15 by 25 feet. You can convert that in your heads, I'm sure. And is located, as you can see here, 
on the front right portion of the villa, so it's quite close to the entrance. So I would expect that visitors could come and be um, ushered straight into this room um, to perform um, whatever rites um, they were about to perform. Now, the Greek word for rite means to grow up. So these were um, initiation rites. They were um, a young person uh, was... Um, it was to help individual young people um, achieve adulthood. Now, arguably... Oh, my God. Done it. Um, this is um, arguably the most famous wall painting from the whole of Pompeii. And it's a Dionysiac or Bacchic initiation. Now, often a drama was enacted in which the initiates performed a role. Um, it might include simulated death or rebirth, the dying of the old self, the birth of the new self. And occasionally, the initiate was guided through the ritual by a priest or a priestess. And at the end of the ceremony, the initiate was then welcomed into this um, cult, this group. So we have a figure here, for example, of a young um, god, Dionysus, here reclining. This is a typical Dionysiac um, attribute or symbol. It's known as the tursos. It's a long rod with a pineapple on the top and decorated with ribbons. Here, this figure is the, um, an old satyr, is known as Papo Salinas. And um, there's a young satyr there. There's a young man there holding a mask of a um, satyr. Now, this is an exquisite example of Pompeian um, wall decoration. And this is, for example, an exquisite painting from this room of a young um, satyr dancing. Now, it's a superb example of the painter's craft. It's quite extraordinary. We are so lucky that we can still see this um, 2,000 years later. But I think the luckiest person in all this um, that we've been talking about is Mr. Dominus, who must be, have been thanking all the gods he could think of that he didn't live next door to the Villa of the Mysteries. Thank you very much.